in 2015, proponents of open access for scholarly publishing seem to be pushing at an open door. Publishers around the world have adopted a wide range of OA practices, from green to gold, hybrids and pure plays. Today, open access business models are a fact of life. Yet, open access raises important, sometimes unexpected challenges for all stakeholders. With OA, the next wave, scholarly publishing is moving beyond a single issue focus on article processing charges to address end to end solutions that engage authors throughout the workflow. Collaboration, competition, commitment. The next wave of open access will put each to the test. Surviving and thriving requires technology and best practices that deliver quality author experience, manage workflows, and coordinate compliance reporting. Good morning and welcome again to the Frankfurt Book Fair and Copyright Clearance Center's town meeting, our third annual such event that brings authors, funders, institutions, and publishers together for a lively, informative, and open exchange, appropriately for a discussion on open access. I'll be asking the panel today what will the next wave of open access bring to them? I will hopefully ask you that same question, and you're welcome to ask questions of our panel. If you are tweeting the discussion, our hashtag is CCC Open Access. You can follow Copyright Clearance Center at Copyright Clear. And I've got a lot of people on stage, and I want to try to introduce them all quickly and get to the discussion, see if we can do this. Um, Josh Dahl is Head of Publishing and Associations for Thomson Reuters. Agnès Henri is Publishing Director at EDP Sciences in Paris. Sean Harris is Communications Coordinator for INASP. Randy Petway is Executive Vice President Global uh, Products for Publishing Technology. Um, Immediately to my left here, we have uh, Richard Wynn from uh, Aries, uh, Aries Services. Uh, he is the uh, v Vice President of Marketing. Uh, and we have as well uh, my colleague at Copyright Clearance Center, Haralambus Marmanis, Chief Technology Officer and Vice President of Engineering. Welcome, Babis. And then towards the end there, we have Helen Sun. Helen, welcome, who is Chief Executive Officer of the Beijing Ingenta Digital Publishing Technology Limited Company. She founded that in 2011 in Beijing as a joint venture with the UK-based Publishing Technology PLC. And uh, she was named the uh, uh, in 2014 as the Annual Digital Publisher, an award from China Publishers and many other awards. And she's also a researcher working toward a PhD uh, from the Business School of Edinburgh University, as well as in the Editorial and Publishing Studies Program at the Communication University of China. And um, I believe that gets, oh, and then we do want to also include a very special welcome to our uh, special guest, Mr. Chen Lin, who is the Deputy Vice President at CPNIEC, the China National uh, uh, Publications Import and Export Corporation. That's a mouthful, CNPIEC, but if you're familiar with China and its publishing world, you certainly know them. Um, they are the largest such organization in the People's Republic uh, and uh, uh, a very distinguished group and very warm welcome to uh, Mr. Lin. Um, I want to get started with Sean Harris. Um, Sean, uh, it's nice to chat with you because I can trust you. You're a former journalist. You're one of my kind, if you will. <laughs> and, and so I know you're going to say something fascinating and interesting. And, but particularly, Sean, because the group that you're working with now is the UK-based INASP. Um, we'll, let people, we'll let you tell people what that stands for. But it is a global network of variety of partners, NGOs and others, who are working to improve access production and the use of research information in developing countries. And if, if there is a story of open access, it's a global story. And it's a story about sharing information. That's the foundation for OA. Um, how, how is INASP working with perhaps some of the people on this stage and the people in the audience to ensure that that transmission of knowledge isn't simply one way from the north to the south, but also two-way? Tell us briefly about that. So, thank you for that. Actually, I could answer with basically all this, all this time. There's, there's lots to say, but um, something I, I feel passionate about is that I think sometimes in conversations in scholarly publishing, we, we sort of say, oh yeah, everyone in scholarly publishing is in the room, and, and actually it's only people from Europe or no North America there. And it is a global um, 
you know, research is global, there's researchers everywhere, um, and we have the privilege of working with some, some wonderful researchers in many parts of, um, of the world, uh, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Latin America. Um, so, 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 I so mean, we, it, <laughs> INASP is, it, it, it's a mouthful, but INASP is, is, is neutral as far as business models, yeah. but open access must be putting some very special pressures on researchers mm. in the Southern Hemisphere, as well as on the publishing communities there, too. Uh, yes, it's, uh, well, I mean, we are, as you say, neutral about business models. We've had um, good relationships with publishers, many in this room, for, for um, the whole lifetime of INAS, which was founded in 92. Um, but, yeah, there's, there are complicated um, things, particularly for people who are not, um, who don't speak English as a first language, um, and maybe don't have the, inf if this is in terms of authors, don't have the infrastructure of um, senior academics who can guide them in the publication process. In perhaps um, one of the big buzzwords at the moment is the predatory journals, and this is you know, something we're particularly keen to be guiding people about, and we're one of the founders of the Think, Check, Submit campaign, which is um, an exciting campaign to try and help authors to make informed decisions. Um, so that's, that's one aspect. Uh, from the other side, we work with local publishers in, in a range of countries, uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, Latin America, um, um, <laughs> Via Mongo Via Mongolia, Vietnam, Lange, yes, yeah. yes, and, and, and you've been conducting surveys and sort of under, trying to understand what their questions are, what their needs mm. are, and we've spoken on this discussion today at this town meeting about the complications of all of this. It must be exceedingly complicated for them, and in particular to be able to follow through on the mandates and the data requirements. I, th I think the thing is it's not a consistent model around the world of how people do open access. There's no... I mean, I think one of the previous panel discussions said that it's just, you know, we don't know quite what's going to happen in the future, but we also we don't know, uh, there's not one, one single thing for a single country. And this is confusing when, I think, when things are set in the north, in the west, for how, um, how things should be done. Um, so, yes, we've, we've done surveys and found a certain level of confusion about what exactly is meant by these these different terms, and it's, you know, as, as we know from the early days of open access when it was just, let's, let's get things free, freely available, it's now this whole, well, some people say, well, it's not open access if it's not CC BY, or it's not open access if you don't deposit your data, or if it's not open access if, if whatever other structures are in place, which is, I think, a confusing picture. Right. And Randy Petway, I see you nodding your head in agreement with what Sean Harris is saying there. And, and working with the publishers that you do, do they recognize this challenge that they have with uh, the world beyond their normal scope? I, I think they, they definitely recognize it. Um, but like most of us, you address the things that are of immediate pain point. So, uh, but the problem is you're just deferring the, the challenges and the pain. So, so yes, I think they see it, but when it's not at your doorstep every single day, you tend to kind of put it aside, but, but that's not a strategy for the future. And it creates, this, uh, as we talked about earlier, there's so many constituents now, you know. More groups matter, and groups that always mattered matter in different ways. So, so it, it's become more complex, more interleaved. So to avoid these issues will absolutely come back and cause problems down the road, so. Yes, that's right. Well, 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 well Babas Marmanis, that's, uh, that's a challenge that we have at Copyright Clearance Center. You're, you're driving the solutions that are coming out of our engineering shop, and you've heard this discussion to so far, and you've heard about this notion that the center of power has shifted uh, from, from publishers being at the center of things, being in control, to beginning to need to share that control with other uh, uh, players uh, in the workflow, the funders, the institutions, and particularly the authors. How is that a technology challenge? Talk about that movement from the established center of power towards uh, other areas, particularly authors, and, and what kind of a, a technology challenge that presents. Yes, so uh, open access is simply a manifestation of the transformative uh, um, dynamics that exist today in the publishing industry. 
And uh, that creates both challenges but as well opportunities. Uh, standards uh, were mentioned earlier uh, are very important, but standards are systems of reference. And so we need standards so that when we talk about something, we can all talk about the same thing. Um, and therefore, adopting standards uh, is very important. Uh, however, if you have 100 standards for one thing, then defeats the purpose. <laughs> right? so, so I think that by entity, uh, we need to adopt a single standard and go with it, the whole industry, so that we all know what we're talking about, whether it be authors, institutions, uh, funding, um, or anything else. Uh, with respect to how we approach that CCC, the, the problem, we've taken a holistic approach, making sure that we can embrace all stakeholders and um, satisfy everyone's need, not all at the same time. Uh, <laughs> we do prioritize, but um, we do have a comprehensive approach in accomplishing that. And, and, and that holistic approach, as you call it, where all things are one in a way, is going to get, uh, it, it, it's a, th there's a drive, as we heard, towards simplifying things. But before we get there, it's going to get more complicated because we're going to see new technologies, um, new services. And, and so really starting on the right foot becomes critical. Yes, that's, that's correct. Um, and... Right now, in order to accommodate the plethora of uh, licensing types, business models, um, and even the uh, complexity of a diverse uh, ecosystem uh, is uh, quite challenging uh, if that's not what you do for a living. Um, and that's what these are, this is the reason that uh, Copyright Clearance Center is um, providing a solution to the market that can address uh, a lot of these complexities without the burden on the publisher side uh, and frankly with ease of use from the, from the author side. Right. In our last discussion, Richard, when we were talking at the end about return on investment and, and recognizing that what's being asked of publishers is frankly a great deal. There's a lot that they need to do now. They didn't have to do before. In the old subscription world, you sold a subscription that was done at the end, at the end of the year. You renewed the subscription. I'm simplifying. I know for anyone in the audience, but that's how it was. And today we have a much more complicated world, multiple authors, various uh, uh, players in the marketplace. Talk about the, the, the drive to ROI and, and, and how publishers are seeking a competitive advantage as well. Yeah, I think things are definitely changing. I was talking to one of the first and largest open access publishers, um, and they were telling me that their growth rate had gone down from 50% to a much lower rate. And uh, they were not associated with any large publisher, and they attributed that to the fact that the traditional publishers had really ramped up their open access uh, initiatives. And I think um, what you're seeing is definitely a maturing now with open access, and it may even go on pause for a few years that while the funders work out what, what's going on um, before it goes through, through further volume uh, growth. Um, but, you know, data-driven models is, is the key. So our integration with RightsLink, for example, it's all driven off of standards so that publishers can modify business models with a, a, a very, in an agile manner. And so uh, that agility to, to change is key. Right. A a agility and, and uh, well, it sounds like Boy Scouts here, but cleanliness. It's all about making sure that the information that's being transmitted, because there's so many people that need to receive it, it has to be clean. That data has to be in the best shape it can be, just speaking as a non-data person. Yeah, be prepared, you know. Right, uh, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, no, I was talking with Josh in, in the break, and uh, we're both noticing that publishers are this close to requiring ORCID for manuscript submission. And that initially will probably be just for the contributing author, but also you've got all of the uh, co-authors. So I think, I think publishers are now seeing the value of uh, good hygiene, as you call it. Indeed. Uh, Helen Sun from, from Beijing in Genta. Um, you see things from the perspective of Beijing where there have been a variety of mandates issued by the Chinese government sort of supporting open access models. Um, and yet in the Chinese environment, the researchers, um, they have their 
native, their domestic publishing world, but they also look out at the world beyond that and look to be published in uh, all the journals that we would recognize. Talk about how that all works out, how, how, how the Chinese publishing world is resolving that to develop its own products, but also to work with and to submit and find their work published in other around the world. Okay, uh, because my, um, I work as a professor as well as working as a, a third party supplier to the whole industry as a technical supplier. And I think over the past years, um, the Chinese academias are trying to submit to international journals because we got the points for everything we submit. And if you submit to a journal SCI or SSCI listed, then you got more points than if you submit to a Chinese journal. So obviously for academias, it will make all worthwhile to submit, try to submit to more international journals. Um, but on the other hand, uh, Chinese governments are investing heavily into this um, digital transmission of the industry. They don't really have a special sponsorship for open access, but then overall we have 5 billion RMB, which is 500 million pounds every year as a sponsorship from the government into the cultural industry. Uh, and the most of the projects they sponsored are related to digital content. And uh, for example, two projects we have been working on over the past year are a, one is the journal platform for China Science Journal Publishing House, which is the largest science publisher in China. And the other one is we work for uh, a China Asian Chinese kind of collection platform. And all of them are open access kind of uh, business. So, so I, I can't say that particularly they would do something about open access, but as a whole, the whole country is quite investing heavily onto the whole digitization and all the new models that could be provided. Right. Well, that seems to make sense because we were spoken about, we need to look at the past, look ahead yes. and think about what we're going to add. Yes. And so by creating these platforms that have uh, an openness to open access yes. uh, is a wise move, it yes. seems. Yeah. Well, yes, I, I think, uh, you know, if we look ahead, then the market is big and we built the largest uh, publication import and export platform for CNPIC. <laughs> so <laughs> Mr. Ling is my um, uh, key customer. And uh, as we said during our previous conversation, I think to cover such a big country, you do need to have a partner who have a big coverage because China is no any smaller than America and it's new it's all new there's nothing which you know many people know about so so I think a partner is important and that's why I strongly recommend <laughs> Mr. Lin to come to this session because uh, if you everybody is interested he can talk about CNPIC and and and, and they have been working with more than 10,000 libraries in China and uh, that's the main users for open access research content right. so well, well th yeah. that really is the challenge of yes. this global environment we have there's so many mm -hmm. uh, journals to work with so many different platforms yes. and we've been hearing about the need for standards and yes. and I guess Agnes Henri um, for you at EDP uh, when it comes to ROI, it's not about getting the numbers right, but it's also about communicating the story of the value of publishing in this new environment. Uh, if stuff is free, people think, well, it didn't really cost so much to create it in the first place. Yes, especially in France, there is a big movement against publishers, and they are also feeling that we don't have uh, any added value. So it's a great deal to explain uh, to them all the work which is done. And so uh, also it's uh, difficult for them to, to pay open access because it's not organized like in UK or you have the, the, the university who manage to, the, the fee for the, the author. In France, its author has to deal with his own money from the laboratory and so on. So they don't want to, to pay and promote uh, gold open access so, and don't understand why they have to pay to publish. So it's a good a lot of works to, to explain all that to them. Right, so it, yeah, it's a communication problem. You can understand how uh, it's a challenge to get them to part with their money, but by offering a variety of services, by creating that platform that you've created at EDP yes, Open, that begins to answer that. Yes, it's one of uh, our role is also to, to standardize, the, to standardize the, f the things, to, to offer uh, more tools to, to the author to, to, to find a way to, to, to 
to publish in open access. Mm -hmm. Josh Dell, you've done a lot of traveling for your job. You were just in China. You've done some work in Latin America as well. I wonder if you can respond to what you've heard from Helen and from Sean and from Agnes about uh, the challenges of this global wave that we're seeing in open access um, and, and the kind of particularly the push-pull environment, not just in China, but many parts of the world where researchers want to see their work in some of the leading journals, but there's also, uh, you know, work being done at home on creating a publishing community there. Yeah, and I think that's an important aspect, is that there's certainly work that you want to distribute that has broad application to the wider world, and in a lot of cases, there's a reason that they want to submit to an international publication because there's already a built audience around that brand, around that journal, that can help kind of distribute the research and, and really help the research community as a whole. But there's also content that's very much more regionally focused. Uh, might be in language, might be in Chinese, for example. Um, there's significantly more journals in Chinese. Um, I think the last count was around 5,000 or so, and, and we can but 5,000 Chinese language journals that, and that's a lot of content that they also want to make sure is open and available to other researchers in China. There's significant growth in researchers coming out of, of programs. So that's, a, in terms of open access, it, kind of the core tenet of it is make it open so that others can benefit and kind of move the entire community forward. I mean, I think from a regional perspective, that's, open access as a way of letting other researchers in the country, whether it's in language, regional only content, or whether it has broader application is, is something that I, through some of the travels, was, was an important point that I, that I heard often. All right. Well, thank you, Josh Dahl with Thomson Reuters. And before we get to our questions, I, I want to end by turning to our guest from China, from CPNIEC, uh, Mr. Lin. <coughs> Excuse me, and, and ask you, you've had a chance to hear our discussions today and to perhaps reflect upon what's going to need to be done in China. And I'm curious about the Chinese language journals and the potential there, the platforms that you've worked with Helen on to create. What, what are the hopes that the Chinese publishing world has for the Chinese language journals as well as for the others that you are creating? Mm. Uh, 感谢我谢谢西西邀请来参加这次的论坛因为我需要一个英文的翻译 还有这个科技界,特别是在图书馆界,引起了巨大的一个反响。I need to say that after the concept of open access was raised, it has got a big influence on the researchers in China, the libraries in China, and also the users of the libraries in China. 特别是图书馆界,近年来每年都会有就是关于自己 就是开放获取的一个专项的一些论坛。Especially on the library market we are working on, every year the whole library society in China have many meetings and conferences on open access every year. 得出的结论跟这个题目是一样的。And the conclusions of all those conferences just meet with your topic here. 就是说开放获取将是未来的一个重要的一个资源的一个趋势。啊，也是这个，这个，这个，应该也是说下一个这个学术的一个一个资源的一个浪潮。And their conclusion is open access is definitely the trend and the direction of the whole society and the next wave as your topic. Right, right.呃，刚才海伦也介绍了，就是中国这个政府虽然没有，现在还没有出台一个一个专门的一个 open access 的一个一个政策，但是。确实，中国政府一直在支持啊这一项的这个这个开放获取的这种形式啊，因为很多的中国的研究所啊，还有还有这个大学所有的科研，大多的经费都来源于国家的经费的支持，所以国家也是特别希望啊这些成果能够得到
Um, as Helen has explained, though we haven't set up a special policy for open access from the Chinese government yet, but the investment and sponsorship from the government is heavy because uh, most of the research projects in China are sponsored by the government. And obviously, the government would want the, a broader society to share the results and achievements of those projects. So, so, so in the recent years, we can see the sponsorship into this area are quite heavy from the government. 呃，应该说一个非常重要的事件就是去年的五月份，呃，中科院、中国科学院和中国呃自然科学基金委他们共同倡议，就所有由他们呃国家支持的啊、呃、这一方面的成果，在十二个月之内必须。Uh, 提供开放获取。Uh, uh, a very important remark is uh, last year in May, and uh, uh, a great announcement from China Academy and uh, the uh, Nature Science Natural Science uh, 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 Funding, which is the largest nature science funding. And they jointly announced that all the projects they sponsored have to be available open access within 12 months after it's published. Right, I remember so, that announcement. It really made things. Uh, 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 yeah. it, it changed things from being UK, US, a yeah. bit of Europe to now suddenly this is really a global yeah. issue.